welcome to Grace, everybody. You're just in a clappy mood today, aren't you? Not a happy mood, but a clappy mood. That's what you're in. I believe that Genesis 22 is one of the 10 most important chapters in all the Bible. It's important because it gives us an example of complete faith in God. It's important because it shows us insight and illustration, really, of God's amazing sacrificial love for us. And it's important because it really challenges us and calls us to to live this adventure of faith. Today, we do wrap up this series on Abraham, and for several weeks, we've been looking into the lives of Abraham and Sarah as they've gone on their journey of faith, and I think you'll admit it's been a bit of a roller coaster. They've had all kinds of ups and downs, all kinds of tests, but today, in chapter 22, and I hope your Bible is open there, you're ready to follow along. Today, Abraham faces the most severe test of all. He is instructed to sacrifice his only son. Now, let's follow this account verse by verse, and then then at the end, we'll draw some application to our own lives. Verse 1, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Now, I want to warn you, if you're new to the Bible or new to Christianity, and you've never heard this story before, you're about to be shocked. In fact, some of you are going to want to be on the phone calling Child Protective Services right away. You want to want to get them involved, and what's going on here? Are these people monsters or what? It used to be, I don't know if this still happens, but it used to be when you were watching TV, And just during the regular programming, suddenly you'd hear this message, this beep would come through on your TV, and it would say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is a test. It is only a test. And we need to keep that in mind as we read this particular passage. A principal of a school may have a fire drill as a test, And to those who don't know, it's just a drill. It may cause great anxiety, but she's not going to burn down the building, trust me. And God is requiring a test here of Abraham's faith, but he's not going to require the actual sacrifice of his son. Please keep that in mind. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, Abraham must have been stunned. I mean, come on. After 25 years of waiting, and finally the promised child has arrived, and now there have been some years that have gone by. They've fallen in love with their son, There's a great relationship here. Why would God give such a ridiculous command? I mean, the pagan nations around them practiced child sacrifice, but Abraham understood that that was totally against God's will. Had God changed his mind after all? And Abraham loved his son Isaac with all of his heart. The wording here is very specific. Take your son, your only son. Now, Abraham had another son from the handmaid Hagar, but Ishmael had been dismissed from the the house sometime earlier because of disciplinary reasons. And Isaac was the only son of promise. Abraham loved him deeply. Now, verse 1 began by saying, sometime later. I wish we knew exactly how long that was. The text doesn't tell us. Scholars guess at this, and they say Isaac was anywhere from a young teenager, and the oldest guesses I've seen is that he was maybe 30 to 33 years old. We don't really know. But the point is, for a period of time, father and son had grown to love each other. 
They had probably fished and hunted together. They had hiked together through the mountains. They had teased about girls and laughed together. Abraham had probably had private talks with Isaac about his brother Ishmael and his whereabouts. They had worshiped together and worked together. How could God possibly ask this? And I would guess that Abraham's response would be, no way, God, that's impossible. You're asking too much of me here. But Abraham obeyed unconditionally. We read on, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. I'm impressed by Abraham's obedience. He didn't delay. He didn't require a second notice. He had what I would call early the next morning faith. Does that describe your obedience to God? When you read something in the Bible, maybe in your small group, you're studying a passage, or maybe in your quiet time, and you read something, and it's not one of those gray areas, it is crystal clear what God is saying Do you have early the next morning faith? Or do you have to sit and ponder it and weigh it and vacillate? Am I going to obey this? What's impressive about Abraham is he just obeyed, period. Now, how could he possibly do that, you ask? Well, hang on. We're going to see the answer to that in just a moment. But right now, let's just keep following the storyline. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Now, here's where we begin to see, friends, a series of amazing parallels between what happens here in Genesis 2 and what's going to happen 2,000 years later in the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mount Moriah was the very place where centuries later, In Jerusalem, a temple would be built, the very place where thousands of animals would be sacrificed here to cover sin. It was the very place where Jesus would be crucified 2,000 years later. And so this is what Bible scholars call typology. It's a type, it's a prefiguring of what was going to happen later in the New Testament story in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. When you hear the word worship, what comes to mind? Probably singing some songs, praying some prayers being together with other people, probably listening to a sermon. But at its best, worship is when we bring the best that we have and give it to God. Worship is offering the best that you have to the Lord. That's true worship. That's why Paul will write later in Romans 12, He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And so the purest form of worship is when we just surrender our wills in obedience to God. And Abraham said, look, we're going to go up there and worship, and we will come back to you, he said to the servants. Now, Now, was he lying? Was he just lying through his teeth? No. He had come to the point in his journey with God that even though he didn't understand what God was doing here, he was believing that God was not going to let Isaac be eliminated. In fact, would you look at this passage that was written centuries later in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, which gives us some insight into what was going on. By faith, Abraham When he was tested, and that is referring to this specific test in Genesis 22 that we're reading today, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises, Abraham, was offering up his only begotten son. 
It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. In other words, the promise was crystal clear. This, these nations, these descendants are going to come through Isaac. So well, how could he possibly go through with this when Isaac was the one the descendants were to come through? Notice these next phrases. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Again, I talked about typology a while ago. Here's your word, typos in Greek. It's talking about that prefiguring, that parallel between Old Testament persons, places, or things, and their corollary in the New Testament. In other words, Abraham had come to the point of saying, look, I don't understand all this, but I believe that if God has to raise Isaac even from the dead, he's going to bring him back. By the way, just as Isaac was, just as Jesus was rather in the tomb for three days, so Isaac here was under a sort of death sentence on this three-day journey to Moriah. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. By the way, the parallels just keep coming here. The symbolism is rich. Jesus would carry the wood of the cross, just as Isaac is carrying this firewood up, Jesus would carry the wood of the cross up to Calvary 2,000 years later. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Now notice, Isaac is very familiar with worship. He doesn't say, Dad, what is this stupid? This, what's going on here? Why aren't we carrying this firewood up the mountain? No, they'd been there before. Isaac knew what offering a sacrifice to God was about. Let me ask you, parents, a, a question. When you say, hey, let's all get in the car and go to church, do your kids say, well, what's, what's this about? Or do they know, do they know that worship is a priority for you? Or when your kids or someone in your family is going through a tough season and struggling with something, do they easily come to you and go, Mom, Dad, can we pray about this right now? Or do they think that would kind of weird you out? That you'd be too uncomfortable with that? I'm impressed that apparently Isaac is very familiar with spiritual things and, and he has a freedom to, and a comfortability to talk about it here with his dad. I think that's the way it should be and Families talking about spiritual things should just be kind of a common thing. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Now, I believe that Abraham must have been choking back the tears at this point, but he was still confident that God's promise was true. He still believed that God would provide an escape. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now keep in mind that Isaac is at least a teenager at this point. He's probably physically stronger than his father, and yet he doesn't try to escape. That was a symbol of the Son of God 2,000 years later who would say, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I willingly go to the cross, in other words. And here, Isaac is willingly permitting his father to tie him up and lay him on the altar. Verse 10 says, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I think Abraham's hand was trembling. I think he was sobbing, pleading with God to do something, to intervene. Never before had a loving father or an obedient son been tested 
in such a way as this. Jesus would later say, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And Abraham loved Isaac dearly. But he was proving here that somehow he loved God more. And then Abraham was interrupted with this unexpected provision. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Notice the urgency of that repetition. And there was never a more welcome interruption to worship than this one. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. Remember earlier when Abraham had said to Isaac's question, God himself will provide a lamb, my son. He was speaking prophetically at that point. And here, this ram is caught in the thicket, this older sheep. Abraham was speaking prophetically, but this wasn't the complete fulfillment of those prophetic words. It would not be again. The symbolism goes on. The typology continues. It would not be until 2,000 years later when John the Baptist would look up and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world It would not be until then that this prophetic word would be totally fulfilled. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, it's interesting, the Hebrew phrase here translated, the Lord will provide, is Jehovah Jireh. I grew up singing a little song in Sunday school, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. His grace is sufficient for me. And Abraham certainly discovered that to be true, that God does indeed provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, this is the first time that a substitute sacrifice is mentioned in all the Bible. And again, in the typology, just as that ram died in Isaac's place, so 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ would come and die in our place as he took the punishment that we deserve in payment for our sins. Well, Abraham had passed the test. But then he was given this unequivocal promise of blessing. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself. By the way, it's funny that later in Hebrews chapter 6, when it's commenting on this, it says that since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. It's Kind of interesting, isn't it? God couldn't appeal, appeal to any higher authority than himself which is what we normally do when we make an oath on something. We put a hand on the Bible and we say, I swear. God couldn't appeal to any higher authority than himself. So he says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Now, I'm certainly no astronomer, but I have read that when you go out on a crystal clear night with the naked eye, you look up at that star-filled sky, you can see about two to 3,000 stars. I don't know if it's true. I've never tried to count them. Seemed to me to be impossible to keep up with all of them, but that's what I'm told. And this must have seemed like such an unscientific statement for so many centuries. And yet now, with powerful telescopes, we know there are indeed millions and millions and millions of stars. There are millions of galaxies. And one astronomer commenting in a journal, who's totally unfamiliar with this passage, 
said, there may be as many stars in the universe as there are grains of sand on the shore of the Pacific Ocean. God was promising to Abraham that there would be many descendants. And he wasn't just promising the Jewish nation that. You see, we get in on that too. Even if you have not one iota of Jewish blood coursing through your veins, if you belong to Jesus, you're a part of this promise. That's why Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And I think that Abraham and Isaac, as they came back off the mountain that day, I believe they were the most joyful worshipers you've ever seen in your life. And if that old hymn, Trust and Obey, had been written at that point, they would have been singing it to the top of their lungs. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. But I love this particular stanza. We never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Could you honestly say that you've really laid all on the altar for God? Even that thing that is most precious to you, even that aspiration, that hope, that thing, that person, that aspiration or desire that you have more than anything else, have you laid all on the altar? And the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Now, in just a moment, we're going to wrap up not just this sermon, but this whole series on Abraham and Sarah There have been so many great lessons, but I want to close this by just mentioning two brief lessons, and you may want to write these words down. Your faith in God will be tested. You can count on it. Young or old, everywhere in between, new believers or veterans in the faith, hear me today. Mark these words. Your faith in God will be tested. And secondly, your faithfulness to God will be rewarded. Now let's take just a few minutes as we wrap up this whole series and let's unpack those two thoughts for a moment. If you fly fly an, an airplane... If you want your pilot's license, you know there are going to be some tests, right? There are going to be physical tests. There are going to be a written test. There's going to be a flight test to show that you have a certain aptitude, a certain skill. you got to do that before you get your pilot's license. If you sign up for a college class, I hope you know there are going to be tests. They aren't going to just give you a degree automatically. You've got to pass the exams. And when you sign up for the Christian life, hear me, you receive God's forgiveness and a gift of eternal life by grace through faith. It is a total gift. You do not earn it. But if your faith is genuine, it is going to be tested, and that's a part of what God uses to help you grow. But we've got to understand the purpose of those tests. So if you're still jotting some notes, I would ask you to jot down two purpose, two purposes of the test that God either brings or allows in our lives. Now, mind you, if you ask most people who are churchgoers, why does God allow you to go through tests? They'll say things like, oh, you do it to earn your salvation. Eh, Wrong answer. Wrong answer. You don't earn a thing by going through tests. Salvation is a gift of God by grace through faith. You don't earn it. Or if you ask them, what's the purpose of tests? They'll, they'll say, um, oh, well, it, it's so God can really see if your faith is genuine or not. Eh, wrong answer. Sorry. God already knows your heart. He knows you completely, has nothing to do with those reasons. 
What is the purpose? One is to bring about maturity in your life. I hope you understand that when you began your journey with Christ, God was not finished with you at that point. He is not finished with you. He desires to bring about complete Christ-centeredness and maturity in your life. James puts it like this, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be, here it is, mature and complete, not lacking anything. So God builds spiritual muscle in your life as you go through tests. And the second pur purpose of the test is to provide a positive testimony to others. A positive testimony. Now, please listen carefully. If everything's going great in your life as a Christian, I don't know how seriously people are taking your testimony. If you've got a beautiful spouse, if you've got some gorgeous kids that are well-behaved and everything's going great in their lives... You've got a gorgeous home and a wonderful neighborhood. If your financial portfolio is soaring and you've got three beautiful cars in the garage, I don't know how seriously people take it when you talk about the Lord. Now hear me out. I hope they take you seriously when you give credit to God. But I'm not sure they do, because I think they're sitting there going, if I had all of that, I could talk a good game too. But when they see you go through trials and testing and still hang on to your faith, listen, your testimony gains credibility. One of my heroes in the faith for decades now has been a pastor named Bob Russell. He pastored in the city where I attended seminary for a number of years, and so I've met him on a number of occasions, just a humble, great man of God. And he tells the story, which is very gripping to me, about teaching a week-long class at Kentucky Christian College. It was a class of pastors, basically. They were aged 25 to about 55 from all different sized churches, and one of the men in the class was a man named Wayne Joslin. Wayne, if you had been kind of scoring the gifting and the aptitude of the guys in the class, I guess that he, he would have not been toward the top. And he pastored a little church of about 40 people in Phelps, Kentucky. Phelps is a little tiny mining town in eastern Kentucky. Bob had asked these ministers to bring in a recording of a sermon they had preached. And so they did. They brought in DVDs or CDs or tapes, some kind of recording of a sermon. And, and the point was that, that just at random, Bob was going to put that sermon on, and the whole class would listen to about five minutes is all, and they would critique the preaching. And that was a point of stress for these ministers, but it was a, a helpful beneficial test. Well, next to the last day of class, Bob Russell, the teacher, pulled out Wayne Joslin's tape and put it in the player. And Wayne began by telling about how he and his wife had their first child. And after a few weeks, she became ill and, and died. And they were heartbroken, just so sad. But he and his wife, Nadine, said that well, God will mend our hearts, and, and soon, sometime later, they, they had another child, uh, this time a boy. And after a few months of watching their son, they, they had some concerns about his development, so they took him to a doctor, and sure enough, their worst fears were confirmed. The doctor said, your son is going to be severely disabled. He'll not be able to walk. He'll not be able to control his, the movement of his neck and head. He'll essentially be strapped to a wheelchair for the rest of his life, and he'll not be able to communicate with you. But the doctor said, that's, that's pretty, pretty rare, and you should not fear. You should not fear having another child. And so a few months down the road, they decided, okay, we're going to try, and then sometime later, they had a third child, this time a little girl. 
they watched her for a few months and they noticed some problems. They took her to the doctor and found out that she had the exact same problem. Now, the tape at this point has gone on for a little bit more than five minutes. It's time for Bob Russell to turn it off and them to critique the sermon, but he noticed from the silence in the room, these guys were no longer listening to a sermon to critique it, but they were being ministered to by the message. And so he kept it running. Wayne Joslin said, when our little girl was 12, she became sick, and we took her to the doctor and then to the hospital, and we thought she was the strong one, the one who would make it, but with his voice quivering, he said, my little girl died at 12 years old. We were devastated. Bob could hear sniffles in the room. He let the tape continue to play. Wayne said, when my son was 18 years old, we took him to the doctor and then to the hospital because... We found out he had pneumonia. The doctor said, well, an 18-year-old shouldn't die from pneumonia, but they put him on a respirator, and he was on that respirator for an entire year, $500,000 of hospital bills that we do not have the money for, and my son died. 15 minutes into the tape now, and then Wayne Joslin, that the Guys in the class had heard laugh louder than anyone. They had no idea he had been through all of these trials. Then Wayne began to talk about he and his wife, Nadine, and how they continued to hang on to God. He told how he continued to preach about the grace of God and the love of God and how good God had been to them in spite of all that they had been through. Bob said, I turned off the tape. And we all sat in stunned silence. He said, I tried to say something, but I I couldn't talk. He said, I had to leave the room just to try to get my composure. He said, I went to the restroom, and I looked up, and I said, God, I don't have any problems. Here's a man who's lost three children, two of them severely disabled, And I think I'm going through a great test when I go on a short-term mission trip to Africa and have to put up with a few inconveniences. God, I don't have any problems. He said several minutes later when I returned to the class, the guys weren't just cutting up and laughing as they usually did. They were kind of praying and ministering to one another. There was still almost a holy hush in the class. He could tell that their estimation of Wayne Joslin had gone up several notches. And Bob Russell said to them, you know, I get to teach this class because by the grace of God, I happen to preach in a church that's large. But you know, the Bible says in heaven, the first are going to be last and the last are going to be first. And I will grant you that this man, Wayne Joslin, is going to be leading the parade in heaven, and I'll have to wear a name tag. Friend, when you go through a trial, when you are tested, it's like God is putting a spotlight on you. And people want to know if your faith is real. When you stand the test, your testimony is greatly enhanced. But I want you to know today, before we finally wrap up, that it won't just be God that these tests may come from. Scripture says that occasionally they may come from Satan and God allows them. Listen to Revelation 2 verse 10. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you into prison. The devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. Sometimes it's the enemy that's testing us and God allows it. So I don't know what you're going through. You may have to endure suffering like Wayne Joslin or like Abraham or like Job in the Old Testament. But as I close, let me add one final thought. The most severe test you may ever endure is the test of prosperity. There's just something about success 
that tends to draw people's hearts away from God. I mean, Jesus himself said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's something about prosperity that just draws our hearts away. I mean, think about people you've known. Thomas Carlyle, the English essayist, said, for every person you show me who can withstand prosperity, well, I'll show you a hundred who can withstand adversity. Think about the people in the Bible who did quite well with adversity but could not stand success. King Saul, King David, King Solomon, Samson, just to name a few. And I say to you, my dear brothers and sisters, when your name is in headlines, when you're spoken well of by everyone, when your business is really booming, when your stocks are soaring, when you're the talk of the town, when you're the one getting the award, the recognized leader, can I ask you something? Can you hold on to God then? Can you still be generous then? Can you still maintain your faith and your trust in God even in prosperity? It is awfully hard to climb the ladder of success and still maintain your spiritual equilibrium. So here's the final word for the, te- for the sermon and for the series. Your faith in God will be tested. And your faithfulness to God will be rewarded. Father, I don't know how anybody else feels, but when I read an ancient story like this from your word, I get so inspired. I say, God, I want to be a person like that. I want to be a person who has early the next morning obedience. I want to be the kind of person like Sarah and Abraham who can hold on to you even when I'm in your waiting room and the heavens seem silent. I want to be the kind of person who can hold on to you even when I'm afraid and I don't understand. Help us as we grow in maturity to be that kind of people who love you and who trust in you and who obey you even when things things seem awfully, awfully difficult. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.